So apparently, the guys from ASAP are pursuing their favorite activity again, namely warning. This time, they warn about the Artemis software implementation. Is NASA repeating the same mistakes as Boeing with Starliner? Then, of course, we have to talk about the latest developments at Boca Chica, with the Starship SN8 cryo-proof tests and super heavy construction. Then Roscosmos continues delivering headlines, they just won't stop. Now they also want to build a reusable rocket which looks mm, oddly familiar. Meanwhile, NASA is testing the new Artemis moon spacesuits underwater, the James Webb Space Telescope completes another milestone and a new study finds 24 super habitable exoplanets. A lot to talk about, so stay tuned! It appears that NASA really learned a lesson from the failed Boeing Starliner test flight last December. Not because the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, short ASAP, you know, the guys and gals that just keep warning everyone about stuff, have great concerns about the end-to-end -end software and hardware testing for the components of the Artemis moon rocket. One of ASAP's members, former NASA flight director Paul Hill, said, quote, there is no end-to-end -end integrated avionics and software test capability. Instead, multiple and separate labs, emulators, and simulations are being used to test subsets of the software. This here, dear viewers, sounds like a really nice recipe for disaster. Because Boeing did exactly the same before the Starliner test flight last December. They just didn't run any integrated end-to-end -end tests for the finished capsule and its software. But as especially the programmers among you know it is really important to run such tests. Because if you put together a machine, which is run by different parts of code, and you never test how the complete code works, and what unforeseen bugs might occur, then your first flight basically becomes a gigantic software bug test. And as you know, that might not end so well. If Artemis 1, which will be an unmanned moon round-trip mission, the first one of the new Artemis moon program, would fail because of a software bug, that would be quite disastrous for the whole program. Of course, NASA promptly defended itself. A spokeswoman from NASA replying to these concerns that NASA in fact would be conducting end-to-end -end testing, but across multiple facilities. Okay, across multiple facilities. This doesn't exactly sound 100% like integrated end-to-end -end for us, but okay, we just hope those guys know what they are doing. But you know who has the advantage of working in an integrated way end-to-end? -end? Exactly, SpaceX at Boca Chica. They are building the Starship, which will return humans to the Moon and carry the first humans to Mars, and they are doing it at speeds 100 times faster than Boeing, Lockheed or Blue Origin ever could. Cryo-proof testing of SN8 has been successful with three cryo-proof tests, which is really an excellent sign, because we know that this is the prerequisite for the next steps, namely getting the three sea-level Raptor engines installed for the 15 km or 50,000 feet test flight or hop. After installation of the three sea-level Raptor engines, we'll have static fire testing. Then SN8 will get the nose cone together with the forward flaps installed. And then we suspect by the end of the month, we might see the 15 km hop. Regarding Super Heavy, as soon as the high bay is finished, and it seems that this will also be the case by the end of the month, stacking of the Super Heavy booster will commence. We can see many Super Heavy steel ring segments already lying around and just eagerly waiting to be put together to form the mighty Super Heavy booster, which will transport the Starship into low Earth orbit, and Starship will then from there reach any destination on Earth or the Moon or Mars. And please consider subscribing to our channel as we are one of the very few anti-PC space channels out there who love to expose the inefficiency, corruption and lobbying of companies such as Boeing and others. Thank you very much and we really appreciate your support.
the mind-boggling efficiency and progress of SpaceX. Of course, also leads to other space agencies to realize that maybe, you know, just maybe, reusable rockets aren't such a bad idea. The Chinese understood it first, and the private Chinese space flight companies, iSpace and LinkSpace, are trying to copy SpaceX's Falcon 9. Even the Europeans understood it, and are trying to develop a reusable rocket with Project Prometheus. The only ones who still haven't understood it, or better, don't want to understand it, are ULA. Because now, even the Russian space agency Roscosmos has understood it. This week on Monday, we already spoke about Russia's plan to build a Russian version of SpaceX's Crew Dragon, which they call the Argo. So technically, people flying with Argo will then be Argonauts. And now, only a few days later, the Russians followed up and presented their new reusable rocket, the Falcon, I mean the Armor rocket. How could we think, even for one second, that the design could be heavily copied, I mean inspired by SpaceX's Falcon 9? Is it the landing legs? Or the grid fins? Or the shape of the payload fairings? Hmm. I mean, come on, this design is so innovative and unique. How could we even for one second confuse it with the Falcon 9? The payload capacity of the armor rocket to LEO will be less than the Falcon 9. With 10.5 metric tons in reusable and 12.5 metric tons in expandable mode, respectively, which is just half of the Falcon 9's 22.8 metric tons to LEO in reusable mode. It's funny how the Roscosmos chief, Dmitry Rogozin, always bashed SpaceX, saying that SpaceX is being subsidized by the US government, and that's why they can ask such low prices. But apparently now the Russians admit the truth, that it really is only because of reusability. Well, better late than never. However, realistically, this new Russian reusable rocket will only be finished by 2026. 2026? Hell, I mean, by then even Blue Origin's new Glenn might actually fly. I mean, come on, by then Starship will have landed not only on the moon, but possibly even on Mars. So yeah, a bit late to the game. That is how disruption works, ladies and gentlemen. You wait a bit too long, you think, oh, that's no problem, okay, no problem, and bam, it's over. Let's see if Roscosmos can actually pull this off fast enough in order to survive. Meanwhile, at the Sonny Carter training facility near the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, the future Artemis moon space suits are already being tested in a gigantic pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, complete with a lot of patriotism. This pool contains 6.2 million gallons or 23.5 million liters of water. Now this is what we call an adequate pool size. The new spacesuit called Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or short XEMU or XIMU, is the first spacesuit which NASA has developed in over 40 years. After these suits have been tested on the water, next they will be tested on the ISS. Two sets of this suit, of course in a finalized version, will actually be used for the two moonwalkers that will land on the moon in 2024. We find it really cool to see that for the first time since the days of Apollo, new moon suits are being tested underwater. This time it seems NASA is really serious about returning to the moon. For all the Apollo lovers out there, to whom we count ourselves, a really nice YouTube channel called Dutch Steam Machine. You, sir, are a hero. We salute you. Has used AI upscaling to upscale some footage from the Apollo missions to 4K resolution. Especially fascinating is the rover footage from Apollo 15 and 16. This just looks incredible. Of course, we will put the links to the videos in the description. Watching this, we got tears in our eyes. Not only because the landscape is so beautiful, but also knowing that we will return there in only a few years, after a far too long time. If this footage already looks so fascinating, 
Imagine what insane high-resolution footage we will get from the moon in four years. It will be absolutely incredible. In other news, the James Webb Space Telescope has reached an important milestone. It completed environmental testing, meaning they have put the James Webb into a simulated launch environment, simulating the vibrations and stress during the launch. It did pass the test. And now, of course, we are wondering why it will take another four years for this basically finished telescope to finally launch into space. If it will be delayed again, I'm sure Jishuan will go full Hulk. Because the James W. Space Telescope will be an extremely important instrument in the search for Earth-like exoplanets, so planets similar to Earth orbiting other stars. The JWST will have instruments so sensitive as to even be able to analyze exoplanet atmospheres. We then will finally be able to detect biosignature gases such as oxygen, a high concentration being a strong indication for the presence of life. Or even maybe techno-signature gases such as CFCs from civilizations who also love polluting their home planet. And there might be many such planets, as a new study has found. Researchers have published a new paper in the journal Astrobiology, where they searched for exoplanets in current databases, which might be super habitable. You know, we always think of Earth as being the best possible planet for life, because we are here and it's the only planet supporting life that we currently know of. But turns out, there are probably planets out there even better suited for life than Earth. For example, planets circling K-dwarf stars might be better, because these stars live 10 times longer than the Sun. Thus, life has much more time to develop and evolve. Also, planets with 1.5 times the Earth's mass would have much more habitable landmass, and such planets would retain the interior heat much longer than Earth. They can also retain an atmosphere more easily. A 5 degree higher surface temperature, in combination with higher moisture, would be better for life as well. They found one planet, KOI 5715.01. KOI is standing for Kepler Object of Interest, meaning that this planet's existence has not been confirmed yet by follow-up observations which could be super habitable. This planet might be a really interesting target for the James Webb Space Telescope. We find this concept of super habitable really fascinating. As we humans often tend to be very egotistical and believe Earth is the best planet in the Milky Way galaxy. We, by the way, also think that this whole discussion all the time about the Fermi paradox and the big filter is absolute nonsense. Sorry, but that is our opinion. It is entirely based on the assumption that we are so smart and have really looked everywhere and found everything there is to find. When in fact, until now, we are even too stupid to find life on Mars. With today's technology, we wouldn't even find possible giant alien artifacts hidden in our own solar system. Yet, we proclaim we haven't found anything, thus there must be a great filter. For us, this is egotism at its finest, like pure human egotism. Anyways, the JWST, together with superhabitable worlds, will, in our opinion, certainly change that line of thinking in the next decades. We are 100% sure of that. And we are also very sure that we will find actually lots and lots of inhabited planets and planets with alien civilizations if our technology is advanced enough and if we look long enough. And talking about the reusable Russian rocket, if you want to learn more about the Russian reusable capsule, the Argo, you can watch this video here. So thanks for watching the JI Space Report. And I would say, on to the future. Or oh, people who don't know us so well will think, what the f***? <laughs> the armor rocket, or how do you call this shit? It's recording already, I pressed. I swear I pressed. Man, good. <laughs>